Welcome to Hawk Podcast 35. Today we're mm -hmm. talking about Q3 2020. We just got done publishing all of our Q3 market research. We're gonna be talking about that. Um, if you find this video helpful, would you click the little thumb up sign? It would help us get our message out. Subscribe to the channel so you can be alerted anytime we post new content. And of course, as always, go to datacenterhawk.com to see what all the other stuff we're working on. All right, I'm joined today by David Liggett, founder Hello, and Michael. CEO of Data Center Hockey. So that's right. There let's you go. let's start strong. You had you were head down for the last four or five weeks. Yes, compiling. That's right. Interviewing, doing comparing, all, doing all of my wizardry yes, work. Yes, you were. So yes. let's start here. What was your biggest <clears throat> takeaway from Q3 2020? Um, well, I think you know the first thing I would say is this will be a record-setting year for the data center industry, and so you know, in the midst of what's happening in uh, 2020 with the pandemic, you know, to be in that spot for an industry to be doing that, it's pretty remarkable. But I think probably the biggest takeaway for me was that the demand, the U.S. specific demand was actually spread out uh, among a number of the markets that um, typically get the demand in the U.S. We call them our like primary markets. But basically, you know, if you look at like the second quarter, so in the second quarter of 2020, that was some of the highest demand levels we had ever seen. And of that 200 megawatts of absorption, that's a fancy word we use for demand. And, and it's not that fancy, but for these purposes, it is. <laughs> I've seen one or two paper towel commercials in my day. It's not that fancy. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but, you know, of the 200 megawatts, 70% was in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this, in the third quarter of the 180 megawatts, 50% of it was in Northern Virginia. So uh, it was more spread out to areas like Chicago, Northern California, Dallas, Atlanta, et cetera. And I would think that's overall very healthy for the industry. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody that is in the industry and you know how big Northern Virginia is getting. And there, everyone, I think, thinks like, hey, at some point, you know, do companies want to continue to invest such large amounts of capital in one specific geographic location. Again, there's no like, you know, uh, I think companies just have to think through, does that make sense when I could invest it in other geographic markets across the US? Now, there is a reason why Northern Virginia is as big as it is the mature, you know, power story that's there, the connectivity, the, the labor, the other companies that have invested for a long period of time, all those reasons. But uh, yes, it is a healthy, um, you know, metric to see that demand go to other markets. Yeah, I think it's also mentioned in our like Q3 summary blog, which you can yes. check out. We'll link to that, which I think, and it has some more detail around yeah. those specific numbers, but certainly something we'll keep an eye on for Absolutely. Q4. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so. you can just find that on our blog, datacenterhawk.com backslash blog. Boom. You're getting real bold with the backslash <laughs> forward slash because nobody really knows, and you're going to upset 49% right. of the people, I, whichever I mean, way you go. I, so I'm so sorry. All right, speaking of that, let's talk yes. about some of the things we talked about three months ago, what we thought, what we prognosticated, yes. as I know you are wont to do. Uh, about this quarter. So talk about some of the things we got right, not to toot our horn, but just say, hey, it's always helpful to look back and say, here's what we thought three months ago, here's what we yeah. think now. So talk about some of the things we got right about Q3. Yes, uh, I think one was just that the demand would continue. Um, you know, I think that certainly was, whenever the data center industry does this, which is we have a, a period of time where there's a lot of activity, everybody's always looking to the next period of time saying, will there be as much? And if not, is, does that mean everything is stopped and slowing down, et cetera? And so certainly doesn't feel like that happened in the third quarter, just as the numbers came out, as well as just a general feel of the space today. You know, at the beginning of the year, we predicted in one of our previous podcasts that, you know, we thought that 2020 would be as strong or stronger than 2019. And that certainly has been the case, but you throw all of the, the pandemic challenges on top of that and how that's boosted some of the businesses of some of the largest data center users in the world, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, and all these companies. So with that going on, um, you know, we believe that the demand will, will not just be strong, you know, 3Q, but also through the end of the year and into 2021. So we, we got that right. So, you know, one of the other things that we got right was that growth in Northern Virginia is, is continuing. I mean, you can see the resiliency of the data center industry in Northern Virginia. 
uh, the, they're the biggest buyers there with the biggest opportunities from a, a land and power perspective. And that is being done today. And so I think, you know, we thought that there would be continued growth in Northern Virginia, and there certainly was in, in the third quarter. All right, so talk about the other side of the coin. Are there some things that we thought would happen in Q3 that didn't end up coming to fruition? We don't make any mistakes, so no. Never. No. Okay. Uh, one of the- Batting a thousand. That's right. Uh, so one of the things that we didn't get right in the third quarter was Northern New Jersey has had almost like a resurgence of growth. So this is a market traditionally, you know, six or seven years ago, a lot of demand around the financial industry and when uh, the- co-location market changed. You saw less and less demand there. A lot of it went to Northern New Jersey or Northern Virginia. Uh, but in the last couple of quarters, we've seen an increase in a lot of these financial companies uh, that are interested in either maturing their footprint, doing built to suits. And so uh, we saw a little bit of a pause, I think, there this quarter. On top of that, uh, the state legislature is working through levying taxes on potential um, financial trades that are going on. So a lot of these companies that have you know, data center footprints in northern New Jersey are starting to really think through, hey, do we want do we really want to continue to grow here or mm -hmm. should we do there? Should we do that somewhere else? So that's that's something that's on the table there. It, they haven't been uh, the, the taxes haven't been passed, but uh, the legislation has not been passed. But if it does, that would have an impact on the footprint there. Let's rabbit trail for a second here. There was a news story came out a week or two ago about the Nasdaq relocating yes. their IT infrastructure yes. to potentially Chicago or Dallas. I yep. think were two of the cities mentioned. Yep. What are your thoughts on that story? Um, Makes sense. I mean, specific to what we're talking about here. And, you know, an area like Chicago with the mature trading and all the exchanges that that are out there, uh, you know, obviously find that market attractive. Um, Dallas, you know, potentially would be another market that, that that could be attractive in because of the maturity of the market, the data center operators that are there, their abilities to still meet the latency requirements that they have to complete the trading trades that they need to. So, um, it's, it's logical. It makes sense. And if I'm the state of New Jersey, I'm probably starting to think through, okay, you know, what do I want for our users that are here? Because that's a, that's a real example uh, of someone that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't keep their footprint there if, if those type of things happen. Yeah. Well, certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, okay. So talk about a couple companies specifically that yeah. we've seen, you know, be very active, um, you know, in the space. And, you know, just that are, that are feel good stories or, you know, companies that, you know, are, are just getting after it. Yeah, I think there's, you know, we talk about data center markets and data center operators all the time. <clears throat> and so it's it's it is neat to see cool to see stories of companies that are changing or doing some things differently or that are maybe taking uh, smart risks here or there. Uh, you know, one that comes to mind is we, we continue to track the market of Portland. And, and actually right outside of Portland, a little area called Hillsboro, a number of construction projects started there. One of the companies that's been there a long time is a company called Flexential. Uh, and it was actually Via West that was was actually there before. Um, but but Flexential, they've got two data center facilities. You know, their first one was, you know, um, five to 10 megawatts from a size perspective. Their second one was in the 18 to 20 megawatt range. Uh, they just started construction on, on a data center facility that will be 36 megawatts over time. So they'll deliver that in, in sections. But I think what it shows is that, you know, they believe that that market is poised for like some larger demand. And in order to do that, you have to have a, a pathway to growth. And so that's I think that's one of the interesting things that I've seen as a company like that doing something like that. You, know, you mentioned them getting larger, but it's interesting they're also getting smaller. They announced a partnership with American Tower. Yeah. So they're kind of pursuing that dual strategy of like larger, yes. you know, facilities and also, you know, some edge strategy, yep. which, you know, will give them tons of grace as everyone else in the market is trying to figure out what that's yeah, going to look sure. like. Uh, but there, that's one strategy. So, I mean, that's actually another a nice little dovetail, but like how company, different companies are pursuing that edge market in different ways. Yeah. So what are some ways, I mean, we talked earlier about it, but what are some ways that we're seeing companies do that? Sure. I think the the edge is something that I think all of us in the industry believe will, you know, is maturing. How quickly it matures, I think it, we're all trying to figure that out. But, you know, you brought up a good example with a Flexential American Tower partnership. Uh, you know, Digital Realty has announced something with Vapor.io. This is in the past six months. That's really interesting where they're uh, working together and collaborating on solutions for, you know, uh, these smaller needs moving forward. Um, 
you know, Switch uh, has a, a product they've developed internally that they'll be able to deploy in different places. And so it's, I, I would say it's, it's just pay attention to the ways that some of the largest data center operators in the world are working to make sure that they can meet the needs of w their clients, whether their their needs are, you know, big, large, hyperscale type developments or edge deployments. Because I think the thing that you don't want to do is lose the relationship with a, a customer because you can't serve the need that they have. And so it's hard to be all things, all people. But I do think that these data center operators are working around the maturity to solve those problems, whether they are big or small, you know, and, and some of these partnerships that you you mentioned, Deal Flex Central, but the other ones that I mentioned allow them to do that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's a little bit of a struggle even for us to understand. We've really drug our feet on reporting on the edge data center market just because it doesn't fall into the categories we have today neatly. Sure. Right. You might do like a, I mean, with these edge data centers are 100KW, 200KW, that just is not going to move the needle a lot. Sure. On our, from our reporting standpoint. So I think, you know, present company included, we've got to get mature sure. around, you know, describing those deals, reporting on them, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, any other companies that you would keep an eye on that I think you're just, they're just exciting, you know, and it's 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 seeing how these companies are, you know, addressing the marketplace. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's been fun to watch what Stack has done over the last six months. You know, this is a company that was formed, you know, only a couple of years ago. Obviously, they bought some assets from some data center oper other data center operators that were out there, but they have made it seems like a lot of progress with some of the large scale uh, developments and leasing that they're. Um, you know, they're tracking. I actually had, now while I'm thinking about it, um, I spoke with Ty Miller. Ty is Stack's chief revenue officer. So I'm sure that will be coming out soon. Um, but a great, great discussion. You know, Ty has been in the space for, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, you know, was with Digital Realty for a long time, um, you know, now with, with Stack. And so just what they have done in a short period of time is, is pretty remarkable. And I think, you know, there'll be someone here in the U.S. and probably other markets uh, moving forward that'll that'll be a, a big uh, company to you know serve the needs of the hyperscale community you know one of the other companies that keeps coming across our radar is t5 you know they've been in the space for a while now but really they've focused on adding additional services so like yeah. a breadth of offering yes um and that's just been exciting to see like and i think had a lot of success like you know yeah. as, as just from our standpoint you know we we track who the owner of a facility is and who's doing the um like the operations yeah. of it yeah so we've flipped a number of facilities to have T5 as the operator, which just sure. shows you know, the success they're having with, yeah. that, with that service. Yeah, and it's a really interesting service to be in given the, I think, the needs that end users have themselves for that service. You know, they don't, a lot of these companies that own their own data centers don't always have the most mature, like, facility management operations. They've only, they only might have two facilities, so they really don't know the best practices necessarily or it's just harder to keep up with those so you bring in someone like t5 data centers that does this you know in so many facilities across the nation uh, that you get the benefit of that you know and two they've also actually just kicked off a number of of new developments that they're you know moving forward with I th you know they're under construction with 4.4 megawatts in chicago they just started construction on their site in portland hillsboro another another, another land in atlanta yeah, <laughs> yeah land in atlanta so they're they're starting to do some things that is really interesting and i'm sure that uh you know the next few years we'll be talking about some of the developments that they're able to complete and leases they're able to do too okay well, let us now pivot, sir. Pivot time. Across the pond, as they say, oh. Europe. So, you know, we've been tracking Europe for about a year now, and really two, but we've had it on the site for about a year. So, yeah. you know, talk about what's going on in Europe. What are the big stories coming out of the European continent? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot. I mean, if you tune into our stuff, our content regularly, you you might hear us talk about the, the maturity of the data center markets, and we talk about how... You know, the U.S. is traditionally two to four years ahead of like what's happening in Europe. And then Europe is a few years ahead of what's happening in, in Asia. Pac. I, you know, just sh that just shows how young the market is right now. And so in the major European markets that if, you know, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris and Dublin, that is where a significant amount of activity is happening. We've seen Frankfurt, as an example, be a market that has grown significantly as it relates to developments that are happening. So data center operators are actually spending the money from a speculative perspective uh, to build facilities, to buy land. And then we've also seen a lot of pre-leasing take place, which, 
you know, the, the, the pre-lease is a, a blessing and a curse because you, you know, are able to lease everything you have right then. But the reality is like your, your, your capacity is taken. So all those other transactions that you're chasing are not, you don't have anywhere to put them. Um, and so I think the, that's one of the reasons we're seeing like, you know, increased like land acquisition going on there. And there's typically an 18 to 24 month development period from kind of start to finish. Um, in most of those European markets, it's probably a little less and certainly less in, in uh, some of the other areas. You know, London is another uh, market that we're seeing grow, you know, obviously in areas like Slough, but there's some other spots around the city that um, are continuing to, I think, grab the interest of the data center operator community and end users. Um, and, you, and you may, I'll just interject here, you may, I think this is helpful to, to help lift and shift someone who's maybe familiar with the U.S. but not Europe. So you said, shift. you know, in the whole, the whole continent of Europe is almost like Northern California, where these development timelines are stretched just because there's higher regulation. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things we heard when we're talking with folks over there is like, you can't house data in Poland and send it to Germany, yeah, hypothetically, sure. or Greece to France, just because they have, you know, GDPR about yeah. data crossing country boundaries. Yeah. And so a lot of these companies, they have to have a footprint in all these different places and to figure out how they're going to move stuff around. Right. Which is leading actually to another trend that we're seeing over there. Exactly what you're saying, which is kind of maturity in the secondary markets that are in Europe. So, you know, um, other areas like Berlin, Madrid, um, you know, Zurich. So markets like that, that, you know, aren't necessarily on like the major European market, um, standpoint, but are very interesting to certain users because they do want to get mature in those markets because of things like that you just mentioned, and that is something that's happening as well. So, you know, we think that the European data center markets, this will probably be the strongest year that they've ever had. Um, and well, certainly the strongest year we've ever reported on. That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Mike. One of one. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, I uh, like, I don't see that demand slowing down anytime soon. Sure. Uh, it, one other thing on London, you mentioned Slough and we were, I was talking to Dan, our European guy, and he yes. said, you know, Hey, tell me if this is appropriate. Cause he kind of handled, he kind of understands us and yeah, you know, Slough, I likened it to like Chicago where, you know, Slough is almost like that Elk Grove area. It's sure. within the metro, yeah. Uh, but the, more of the development in that city yeah. is happening there, where yeah. there's still companies that need to be downtown London, by the Thames, as they say. <laughs> I think they're all. Kind of, I actually think Slough's actually on the Thames too. My geography is terrible, but it's within the metro. But it's the hot spot. It's the submarket, if you will. Yeah. Is that the appropriate real estate yeah. term, David? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Submarket. Sub no, but I, I do like every market has a story. And that's certainly an interesting one in London, you know, and, and there's reasons that these little submarkets have developed the way they have. You know, a lot of it is around the infrastructure maturity. A lot of it is around like carrier hotels, where those things are located and who wants to be close to those, how close can you be? Um, and so that's certainly an interesting like story in London and, you know, that area will continue to grow. Okay. All right, now let's pivot again. Another pivot. I'm getting dizzy. I've We're pivoting so much. So much. In this yes. Podcast. So let's look. I'm let's look at the <laughs> rest of the year, the rest of 2020. Yeah. What are some things you're keeping an eye on over the next three months as we close out this year? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of at the end of this year, this will be you know we'll be putting the the kind of final touches on probably the the largest demand year ever in the data center space, and. If you, I mean, we talked about at the beginning, but if then you consider that that's happening in the midst of everything that has happened to us and everyone in the last 12 months, it's, it is extremely remarkable. Um, you know, the data center real estate asset class is like one of the shining stars right now in the space because of, you know, how these other industries have been hit so hard with what's happened, the pandemic, and, and this has only sped up the growth process in the U S uh, I'm sorry, in the industry. Um, so we're certainly paying attention to the demand. I think the fourth quarter is actually going to be a strong quarter for growth. And as, as compared to if you look at last year, yeah, you know, Q4 was pretty, it was light, pretty light. light. Yeah, there we go. As hey, we say L in the hey, industry, L I T E, not oh, yeah. L I G H T. So anyway, yep. there's a difference. Um, so I, I think that's certainly something that is worth watching. Um, I am interested in like, I don't even think we had this on here, but I am interested in some of the markets that are, are bigger that traditionally don't have, you know, 
bigger demand quarters like a Chicago, like a Dallas, like an Atlanta, you know, if you can get to multi megawatt demand in those markets, uh, that that really changes things. We saw some of those markets do that in the third quarter, um, but I I'll be interested to see if that happens again in the in the fourth quarter because some of these markets go from like you know it's like it's three deals being the big part of the absorption, and then there's you know a small handful that are the rest. Um, but without those bigger deals, they've got a lower, typically like a significantly lower number. So that'll be interesting to watch. Um, I'm also interested to see like the construction projects that begin in the fourth quarter, you know, cause we saw in the, in the third quarter, we saw the actual like average vacancy rate across the top 10 markets that we track go down by like one and a half percent. A lot. So what it shows is that there was, a, there was less pre-leasing and more of the available inventory was leased. Yeah. So that to me says, okay, there's going to be some construction projects that are starting. We're seeing that in Portland, Northern Virginia, um, starting to see some of that in Chicago, uh, some in Atlanta. You know, Phoenix is a little bit different. But um, so watch out for the construction projects that are coming. I'll issue a dadism. Buckle up. <laughs> you follow that account on either I, Twitter or Instagram called not. The Dad? No, but yeah, I'm, you're a dad now? But but you're prime That's, dad. Okay, but you're definitely a dad. I've, yeah, Austin's I'm, I'm reminded dad. of that every yeah. time I try to make some a joke of us are with just dads in waiting. Yeah, like and I also get like from from our he, uh, our oldest, I'll get dad. That's uh, a new, you know. He'll get some. Yeah, it's kind of like you're embarrassing embarrassing me. Hey, one I did have this dad. Uh, this is maybe just a you get a lot of. We're gonna pivot to parent talk real fast. Sure, go ahead. Um, parent corner is yes, Bill Simmons would call PC. It. Not PZ, PC. Um, my 13 year old has a cross country meet today. I was telling Austin this. I'm so excited. But you got to read that book I was mentioning earlier. Anyways, go ahead. Anyway, he said, uh, you know, I was like, hey, bro, it's going to be like 65 degrees when you run. So I know when you run, you shorts and your shirt or whatever, but like you probably, while you're standing out there, you want to have something, you know, like a windbreaker or something to just stay warm. Because too, if the wind is, he's like, dad, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm like, bro. I'm just telling you, like, you're going to be out there, and you don't know if you, like, when they run, it's like, they say it's from 4.30 to 6, so he could be at the 4.30 and stay till 5, you know, have to sit there till 5.30, so yeah. we have now hit the point where he, like, is like, I have, I know the, I know a better way. At some point, we're relegated to being the Senate, to our kids <laughs> yeah. as presidents. It's advise and consent. That's it. There's no ordering around. That's it. There's no super majority. Anyway, There's so nothing to be said. You know, I'll, it's a great uh, report next podcast garment choice for a cross-country race. What? A tank top. Oh, of course. Which probably school which, issue tank yes, top. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. Amazing. He I I'm very excited to learn about the exploits of young Grayson. Well, yes, it'll be fun to report on. So All right. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for listening. Again, if you like this, please like the content, share it to your heart's content. It would help us out greatly. Uh, subscribe to make sure you get alerted anytime we got new content. Again, datacenterhawk.com for everything else we're working on. See you next time.